don't need our Lord every month. Come on. Not every week. Oh, oh, come, on. Yeah, oh right. come on. Not every week. No, no, no. Not every week. We need him not even every day. Come we on. need him every hour. Every hour. Amen. 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 Number 318. That's good stuff. That's good 318. Stuff. Amen, brother. All the time. <coughs> let's go for time sake. For time sake, let's go one, two, and four. One, two, and four. All right. Uh, everyone familiar with this? Alright, All right, here we go. Right. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need Sake, we're gonna go one and three. I want to do all three, but one and three. All right, all right, right. one and three. Here we go. What a fellowship! What a joy divine! Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness! What a peace is mine! Leaning on the everlasting. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Robert, come up. Oh, 
Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your sacrifice at Calvary, Lord thank God. You, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for covering us all here, all that were saved. I believe everybody in this room is saved, covered in the blood, Lord Jesus. Amen. And we thank you so much for that, Lord God, that we may come before you, Lord God, and sing praises to the Most High. Yes. I pray that you protect everyone that may be on the way still today, Lord God. I pray that you bless this meeting and that you you bless our speaker, Lord God, and fill him with the Holy Spirit that we all may get what we need individually and that you may work on our hearts, Lord God. And I pray Amen. that I pray that you bless the rest of this worship that we do for you, Lord God. We don't get to sing too many songs here for you, Lord God, just because of time, Lord God. But I pray that every word, every word sinks deep into us, Lord God, and we really Let's listen stop, and, and, and really understand what we're singing and what we're saying to you, Lord God. And I thank you so much for this opportunity to come and come before you, Lord God, and all this I pray in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Amen. All right, y'all may have a seat. All right. Y'all may have a seat. Let's take out the white, uh, white hood books. White hood books. Let's go to page number uh, 37. Number oh, 37. Yeah. 37. I'm on. Which one is this? Uh, probably you guys haven't sung it before. <laughs> oh, 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 come on now. All right. All right, brother. Settle. All right. Yes. Woo -hoo. settle. All right. right. Come, come on, brother. Come on. Stand settle. If you're listening to this or if you're here and you don't know. Come on. You got to know. Yeah. All right. Wow. All right. The whole account settled. There was, was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing for sins yet unforgive. My name was at the top and many things below. I went unto the keeper and settled long ago. Long ago.
always forget that camera, so thanks, Brother Jack. Yeah, 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 no worries. Hello. I am not doing so well today, but you know what? When the flesh gets weaker, the spirit is even better. Amen. I won't touch it, amen. <laughs> I won't even, I'll try not to even touch the pulpit, yeah? Um, so Friday, this upcoming Friday, we're going to have discipleship at 7 p.m., and we're going to have Bible study at 8 p.m. at Pastor's Place. Please contact him if you need the address. He'll let you know. Um, also, thank you all for watching online, and thank you for all those people who are praying for us. Amen. Lord, so Lord willing, I hope you guys can all attend the Sunday street preaching this sun, this upcoming Sunday, 10:30, same time, same place, at Chev at the Chevron Corner, and we're gonna amen. preach Hellfire, Amen. I know somebody somebody told us uh, preaching Hellfire on the street doesn't work, yeah, but uh, we've seen plenty of souls listening and getting saved, Amen. Amen. All right, memory verse is going to be Psalms chapter 119. Please turn there, Psalms 119, and it's going to be verses 104 to 105. Longest book in the Bible. And it's got a lot of good verses, amen. 170, 176 verses all divided up into eight, uh, into parts of eight, actually. Interesting fact. Um, Psalms chapter 119, verses 1, 104 to 1 through 5. The Bible reads, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'm just saying, you know, when we got saved, we hate every false way, right? We understand the ways of the Lord through the Bible, and that's why we hate those cults that bring people into hell. Amen. Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Without this book, I don't think I know, I, don't, I would know where I'd go. So keep that in mind. And now we're going to have a special from Brother Jack. I don't know if some of you, uh, maybe some of you guys heard this. This is a song that was written by uh, Doc. I've been listening to this song for a while, and I didn't realize it was written by him until I was looking at the words last night, and then I found out it was actually written by uh, none other than Dr. Ruckman. So wow. It was, wow. Uh, it, was a, it was a blessing for me that I, I saw that because I know that uh, a, a lot of uh, Bible believers uh, um, know how he teaches, but uh, they don't know. He, he did everything. Is there yeah. anything that he didn't do? Yeah. Oh, no, no. <laughs> he did uh, it all to the glory of God. So, amen, uh, amen. 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 All right, this song is called What a Day. All right. All right, brother. offering for us and ask God's blessing upon the church service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. I come to you in prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Always, Father, I want to first ask forgiveness of my sins, Lord. Um, I pray that you would take this offering today 
and whatever we're able to give that we would give cheerfully, not of necessity. I remember uh, my first time coming back from church camp, the first time I went, I had literally no money at all. And it just so happened that the pair of pants I was wearing that day, I reached in it, there happened to be $3. <laughs> and I've, that day, uh, more so than any other day, I've never felt like I gave more to you because it was all I had, Lord God. Mm. So whether it's the two mites of the widow, whatever it is, Father God, I pray that you would have it to be given with the right heart because we know that you don't actually care about the money, Lord God. You care about the heart. That's and you it. care about That's us putting it. our faith in you, showing you, Lord, I know you're going to provide for me. Amen. And I'm thanking you for providing for me as well. I also want to pray, Lord God, that, um, you know, uh, like Pastor was saying, some of us here, you know, for whatever reason, we weren't able to go to the church camp this last week. And I just pray, Father God, that you would not let, um, you know, you would not let the devil or the flesh or anything like that um, get into our hearts, the people that may have, uh, you know, not been able to go to where um, he would hinder the spirit in here today. God, amen. I That's pray, good. you know, the Bible says um, to restore such a one <coughs> in the spirit of meekness and in fear. Amen. So I pray today, Lord God, that those that were not able to come, that you would fill them with the same you know, Holy Spirit power that we felt up on the mountain so that Amen. we could have our own mountain revival here Amen. today Amen. in this room, Amen. Lord God. I pray all these things in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And even so, come quickly, Lord. Amen. 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 Okay, please open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, please. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and we will read verse 35. Hebrews chapter 11. And we will read verse 35. Verse 35. The chapter, if you're unfamiliar with the passage, is about the heroes of faith in the Bible from beginning to end in the book of Hebrews. And they are set forth as our examples, you got to understand. It's very easy to go through this Christian life and to lose the joy, to lose the fire, to become very weak in Christianity. We, you got to understand, we live in the day and age of a Christianity that has become very weak. That's right. Amen. And we got to be strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. And how we can look to as our examples is the heroes of faith back then. Please look at verse 35. Women received their dead raised to life. Uh, received their dead raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. All these lists of Christian heroes is not just from the biblical days uh, till the book of Hebrews. It's for all time, you got to understand. God saints throughout all time. Yeah, and we can learn from this passage how we, as Christians, have faced tremendous persecution, but we receive a greater reward after that. And I want us to look at those kind of Christians back then. And if we would look at those Christians back then, then we can be encouraged and stand the fight. And we got to understand this as well, is that we got to realize, and if you, get, if you become a pastor, you'll learn this, is that we don't live in a day of Philadelphia. That's right. We live in a day of Laodicea. Yeah, right. So you got to realize that because we live in a day of Laodicea, so many people don't have the mind of a Philadelphian Christian. Amen. So uh, if you want to be a Philadelphian Christian to minister to a Laodicean person, you got to go down to their level. You got to be patient. You got to show grace. You got to show love. And make them open their eyes and see 
how important it is to be a Philadelphian Christian. That's good, that's good. Philadelphia, a Philadelphian Christian is on fire, but with, uh, because he's so much on fire, he's going to burn the layout to stand next to him so easily. That's so good. you gotta, to, uh, you gotta have the temperature adjusted, where the layout to stand person can get adjusted to the heat, and then you can bring up the fire more and more and more, where the person does not get burned. Like uh, if you put a frog in the middle of a water, if it's not boiling water, then the frog won't just jump out of the water. The frog, you know, you got to put at the temperature just right. And then when you heat it up higher, higher, higher to bo boiling point, the frog is so comfortable that he couldn't tell. And then he's dead. And then he's caught on fire. So you got to realize this is that that's the same thing with loud sand people. You got to understand. You got to make them adjust to the heat where they can get comfortable. That's good, brother. And you experienced it at camp, right? When we got adjusted to the heat and got so much fire, 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 got so much on fire that you didn't even feel it, right? Yeah. You just got, you just thought it was normal and you just kept going with the fire. Yeah. So you got to understand that with Christians today. So because we live in a day and age of Laodicean, I want us Laodicean believers and Christians to realize that we got to get more on fire for Jesus Christ because if we look back at the days of Philadelphia, they put us to shame. And whenever I look at these Christians, it always encourages me not to whine, not to quit, not to quit the ministry, and to continue to shed forth grace and love to people, and to not give up the fight. So I want us to stop being Laodiceans today. I want some of you people to understand what Chris, real, and I'm talking about real Christianity was like back then. I'm going to talk about men, women, and children, old people, who actually knew what Philadelphia Christianity was like. It's a tradition that I always do once in a while, once in a year, or once in a while. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Let's pray. Oh, oh, yeah. God, my Father, I pray that you'll fill within me the power of your Spirit, wash away my sins with your blood. <laughs> this is the sermon that you gave for me to preach today, so I'm going to preach it. I pray that it'll be a blessing to the hearers, but most of all, make us the kind of Christians you want us to be, Lord, and to yes. give glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My first point is violence out of tribulation. <laughs> violence out of tribulation. you got to realize that during the days of the martyrs, we're going to talk about people who lay down their lives for Jesus Christ. That's what martyr is. Martyrs, they went through tremendous torture and pain. And if I described to you some of the torture and pain, you would think it's like really grotesque. I mean, it's worse than the Holocaust. It's worse than any other torture, torture that I've heard from, that people ever went through. Now, some of you have uh, been saved. You used to be Roman Catholics, but now you got saved and became Bible-believing Christians. Hey, amen. 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 You wouldn't understand until you start to know more about Bible-believing truth. When you understand more about Bible-believing truth, you would realize how wicked the Roman Catholic Church Amen. is. Amen. And for a first time here, that might be strong. Why? Because you have not seen so much of the book yet. Yeah, Until you right. see the book, then in time and time more and more, you'll come to understand. And then you'll come to a point where you'll be like Rob and Tom and some others, where they would just really hate the religion that they used to be in. That's right. and, I'm, and I'm talking about these people, they love their Catholic Church. I'm telling you. I mean, Tom hated Baptists. He didn't like me. That's right. He didn't, Amen. That's he didn't, right. He, our church is the last place you go to. So you got to understand that when, they, when Bible believers come to a point where they criticize and hate the Catholic Church, they're not just doing that just because they're, in, uh, they're not sensible, they don't have any sense, and they're being irrational. No, because you haven't studied, didn't you? See, until you study and see how wicked the system is, then you'd realize it. And this is not a brain, this is a no-brainer either. I was at Berkeley. Liberal schools always, whenever they mock Christianity, criticize Christianity, which religion, which church is it connected to? Catholic Church. And you know I'm right if you took those college classes. It's during the day in Middle Ages, the Middle Ages of the Catholic Church. So you got to realize that how wicked the Catholic Church is. Rome has always uh, crucified, killed, and tortured many martyrs throughout history. And we're going to talk about how they crucified and tortured Bible-believing Christians and how they stood strong in the faith. It would put you to shame. You know, you're so busy with work and you got family problems. 
your money is running out, you go through certain kinds of church problems, and it's very, and then as Laodiceans, we whine easily, we throw in the towel easily, and that should not be the mentality. You got to realize that Christians during these days, men, women, children, knew better than you and I did. Let me describe to you some of the tortures that they went through and, you know, compare that with your torture that you've been through in your everyday life. You ever heard about the rack? The rack was consisted of small ropes and they would tie the hands and the feet of the, of the person. And then once they stretch out the rope, what would happen is that those little ropes would cut through the skin, slice through the muscles and even reach the bone. And as they kept pulling the rope more and more and more, the blood was squirt out in eight different directions while the body is hung in midair. That's what the rack was. There's another torture device called the pulley. And these ropes, they would be tied with your hands behind your back and they would hoist you up to the air. And as they hoist you up to the air and when you, you go up like this, see? As you go up like that, your feet is tied with nearly 100 pounds of iron. Now, what's the tendency? The tendency is that your arm would go like this, see? Go this way. And what would happen is that once they loose the ropes, then the body would fall down, and before it, the body lands on the floor, they pull the rope again, and then what would happen? Then the body stops midair, and then crack goes the arm, causing a jerk reaction of the nerves and joints dislocation and internal bleeding. Then you know what they do with those dislocated joints? They set it back up again, and then they go for another round. The Iron Maiden, some of you have heard of that coffin with spikes. Yeah. It was, the spikes were inserted in such a way to not cause immediate death. And the spikes would sometimes even pierce through the eyes. Can you imagine as that coffin lid closes and you see those spikes go right like this? and you tremble in fear and you close your eyes. There's another torture device called the water table. And basically you'd lie down on the table, they'd force a rough cloth slowly down with water. And then that, until all the way it reaches the intestines. So the person is suffocating while slowly drowning at the same time. And then what would happen is that they would force out the rag once it reaches all the way down here. And when they pull out the rag, the intestines all tore apart on the inside. I can tell you a Bible-believing, I can tell you stories after stories of Bible-believing women who are pregnant with babies. And they were about to give birth to their first boy, firstborn, the great joy of their life. And those babies died because of the water table. There was another torture device uh, called the heretic fork. And the heretic fork is a large fork. And they would tie it underneath the chin directly like this. So the person is so forced uncomfortably to be like this all the time because the slightest movement of the chin or the head where it's tempted to just bow down just a little bit or bend just a little bit, it would pierce easily through his mouth. Victims were squeezed back and forth with rollers filled with knives as well during the Inquisition. I don't know if you knew that. The burning stake was one of the worst torture devices you can think of. Sounds so simple, but it is the worst torture device because why do you think God chose hell fire for all eternity yeah, at the end? Because there is something about that. Victims would be burnt alive for hours. And I'm talking about hours. It would take a long time. People who were very fortunate, they were choked to death in the smoke so that they don't suffer in the fire as much. Those who were even more fortunate than the people who choked to death in the smoke, are the people who begged for mercy. And if they begged for mercy and forgiveness, the Jesuit would tie the gunpowder around his neck. Out of mercy. <laughs> Out of mercy. That's their way of mercy. And once they tie the gunpowder around the neck, once the flame catches fire, the gunpowder blows off their head and they die easily. The stocks. You ever seen the stocks during the Middle Ages? Sometimes you see those in television shows. But those things are not as innocent or harmless as you think. Basically, when the victim's feet were in the stocks, they were first blistered. Then, after they were blistered, then they would be branded. 
And if the person will not deny Jesus Christ, will not renounce his faith after that, then they would uh, burn the feet sometimes. Or they would tear out one toenail at a time. Would you, would you, would you accept the Catholic faith? No. Bam! Would you, uh, would you reject the Catholic faith? Then another toenail goes out while the person is screaming in pain. And then you got eight more to go. Sometimes uh, they would tear, if the nails are all torn out, then they would go down to the toes, to the heels, to the pieces of their feet. And this was a favorite torture device for little children, you got to understand. For little children. Little children. Can you imagine your own little boy being tortured just because he's a Bible-believing Christian? These would fail to include so many torture devices that I could not tell. Victims were thrown off cliffs onto spikes to die slowly. Women's breasts were pierced by hooks and then torn apart. Babies were ripped out of pregnant mothers and then fed to the pigs. Victims' eyes were gouged. Victims' feet were crushed by the Spanish boots. Victims' head exploded with their mouths filled with gunpowder and fire. Victims' private parts were severed and placed on top of poles for public t display. Victims' teeth, eyes, and bones were plucked out from head crushers. Victims' bodies were burned and broken by the wheel. Victims were rolled back and forth with rollers filled with spikes. Victims were burned alive with boiling pitch as lantern lights. Victims were tied with animal skins to be torn apart by the dogs, the hungry dogs. Victims were locked up in bags of scorpions and then tossed into the rivers. Victims were chained close to the prison floor and walls to be infested with rats and maggots. Victims' ears and their mouths were filled with hot lead and victims choked to death in their own body parts, urine, and dung. Of course, we must realize that I suffered such tremendous persecution and trial and suffering when I'm so busy and I'm so uncomfortable with a little sun heat and criticism from people. See, you got to realize what kind of a day and age we live in. We live in a day of such comfort that we forget what real Christianity is like. I mean, if someone uh, makes fun of you about Jesus Christ just one time, that's enough to throw out your faith. That's enough for you to skip all Sunday services. That's enough to throw away your Bible. You got to realize that is pitiful. That is very pitiful. There's in a small town in Pomerania, a group of soldiers who captured women and little girls. And these women, these Christian women and Little girls who are Christians, some of them were up to 10 years of age. And while ravishing the children, they forced the women to sing hymns. You love Jesus? Oh, how I love Jesus. Sing that song while I'm ravishing your child. If they didn't, they would cut the children to pieces. And then afterwards, they forced the women to gratify their lusts or they would burn the children alive. How many Bible-believing women do we have who can stand up for Jesus and stay strong? Or to throw in the towel after a little bit of persecution and suffering? What about this person right here? Here's a, there was an old man who was stripped naked and tied on his back to the table. And you know what they did? <laughs> they placed a large wild cat on top of him and they tied that wild cl cat close to his stomach. And what they did was they pricked that cat and every time that pricked that cat that cat went insane and started to claw and it tore that old man's belly to shreds and then the cat was also chewing on his organs while they kept pricking that cat how many old people do we have who will stand up for Jesus Christ who will who will throw in the towel just because of a little bit of suffering health problem and persecution what about this person named William Lithgow he was accused of being a a spy and he was accused for religious treason. What happened was that he suffered solitary confinement. He was then tortured on the rack for five hours. The rack that had that, those rope that would go, those little ropes that would tear through the skin and the muscles, reach to the bone and blood squirting out eight di different directions. Yep, that kind of rack. For five hours, 
Five hours. Then he was closely tied to the walls, being infested with vermin that would go to his eyes and to his mouth. And while sweeping the prison floors, they would deliberately sw sweep the vermin on him. So no, this is not exaggeration. No, I'm not being over dramatic right. here. That's true. Amen. Facts. His feet were tied so closely to the iron shackles that actually his feet became part of the iron shackles eventually. When the because this was proven when the keeper broke off his shackles, it tore off half an inch of his heel. In the end, he suffered 60 different tortures during his sentence. 60 different tortures during his sentence, and 11 more after his sentence. No joke. No joke. You know what? You live in a day and age that you, all you see is comfort and luxury and riches. Right. See that? And when you go through five different tortures or problems or trials, what do you do? You, you don't come to church anymore. You don't pass out tracks anymore. You don't have, you lose the desire and the love for Jesus Christ. I mean, what kind of a day and age we live in? See, Philadelphia fire really is hot, isn't it? It would burn a person real easily, make a person walk out of church service, not stay in the Lord easily, wouldn't it? You see how far we have fallen? We're too blind to see that. We are too blind to see that. And we always make an excuse to skip church service, street preach and visitation, discipleship, uh, Bible study, uh, fellowship. Our own walk and talk with Jesus Christ. Oh, that's good. But that's one, true. two, three, four, yeah. five, or ten problems when you didn't go through 60 physical, literal, bloody tortures and 11 more after that for Jesus Christ. How far have we fallen? Here's another person named John Frith. He was tied to a stake to be burnt alive. However, the fire sticks were so few when they burnt him that, and the weather was so windy that even though it burned him, it blew off the fire. And already his hair and skin was scorched. So they had to light a second fire. When they lighted a second fire, it did burn his lower and upper parts. But the sticks were so few again that the wind blew it out again. They had to light a third fire. He was black in the mouth. His lips sunk to the gums. And his tongue was completely swollen that he was beating his chest so much in pain. And as he kept beating his chest so much in pain, one of his arms fell off. And then the other side of his arm on the tips of his finger was gushing out fat, water, and blood at the finger's ends. He finally died at the third fire. You think that's bad? This is one full paragraph. I'm going to read one full paragraph, word for word, about one person who was tortured. Pay attention to this one. Here was a Protestant preacher. This is how they tortured him. They placed him amidst them and made him the subject of their derision and mockery during a whole day's entertainment, trying to his exhaust his patience, but in vain, for he bore the whole with true Christian fortitude. They spit in his face, pulled his nose, pinched him in most part of his bodies. He was hunted like a wild beast until ready to expire with fatigue. They made him run the gauntlet between two ranks of them, each striking him with a twig. He was beat with their fists. He was beat with ropes. They scourged him with wires. He was beat with cudgels. They tied him up by the heels with his head downwards until the blood started out of his nose nose, mouth, etc. They hung him by the right arm until it was dislocated and then had it set again. The same was repeated with his left arm. Burning papers dipped in oil were placed between his fingers and toes. His flesh was torn with red hot pincers. He was put to the rack. They pulled off the nails of his right hand. The same was re repeated with his left hand. He was bastinoed on his feet. A slit was made in his right ear. The same was repeated in his left ear. His nose was slit. They whipped him through the town upon an ass. They made several incisions in his flesh. They pulled off the toenails of his right 
foot. The same was repeated with his left foot. He was tied up by the loins and suspended for a considerable time. The teeth of his upper jaw were pulled out. The same was repeated with his lower jaw. Boiling lead was poured upon his fingers. The same was repeated with his toes. A knotted cord was twisted about his forehead in such a manner as to force out his eyes. During the whole of these horrid cruelties, particular care was taken that his wounds should not mortify. Yeah, no kidding, if he went through that much, they deliberately didn't want to kill him. Taken that his wounds should not mortify and not to injure him mortally until the last day when the forcing out of his eyes proved his death. Fox's Book of Martyrs, page 191. Can you tell me what you're going through again for Jesus? What are you going through again? Oh, what hard times you're going through? Why you can't come to church anymore? Why you can't pass out tracts anymore? Why you can't uh, participate in helping out the ministry? Uh, help out the pastor? Uh, pastors, why are you throwing in the towel again? Can you tell me once more? Vessels out of the tribulation. That's my second point. Vessels out of tribulation. Now, please, don't misunderstand me. I don't belittle people's hard times they're going through. You know what kind of person I am. Yeah, it's true. Amen. I mean, I don't say, I don't beat up a person whose loved one passed away and say, you got to stand strong for Jesus Christ, blah, 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 blah. No, we don't do that. We go there to the funeral service, we support them and love the person, etc. Yeah. But that should not be the only, but just because of that, that shouldn't be the reason why you don't serve God anymore. Just because you have a health problem doesn't mean you should stop serving God. Just because finances are really bad and then you lose a car, you lose a house, you lose a job, you lose friends and family, doesn't mean you should bail out on yeah, God. That's right. That's right. I mean, un until you have a paragraph, uh, uh, if you are going through something, I'd be happy to write it out in this paragraph and replace it for you the next time I preach Fox's Book of Martyrs. And then I'd like to preach about how much you suffered and you have good reason to quit. My second point is vessels out of tribulation. Look at all these different vessels who went through the fire for God and they became much fine gold. And it is so encouraging when you hear that people of your own age, people of your own gender, people of your own background, that if they can stand strong for Jesus, you can certainly stand strong for That's Jesus true. too. There was a woman named Mrs. Prest, and she was brought before the Catholic Council. She was first publicly ridiculed for her short stature and her ugliness. But you know what? She always refuted their Catholic doctrines. And then those Catholic scholars, they excused that, oh, she's poor and she can't even read or write. You know how she replied? True, though I am not learned, I am content to be a witness of Christ's death. And I pray you, and I pray you make no longer delay with me, for my heart is fixed, and I will never say otherwise, nor turn to your superstitious doing. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good yeah. She was offered money, but you know what? She rejected the money because, she said, I am going to a city where money bears no mastery. Yeah, that's good. And while I am here, God has promised to feed me. That's good. Amen. She was assaulted and constantly burdened by her own husband and children. Making her, trying to pressure her to deny Jesus. The Catholics forced the family members to persuade her. Can you imagine how much sorrow she was going through? When she was sentenced to death, you know what she did? She just praised God instead, despite of the persecution from her own family. You know what she said? God forbid that I should lose the life eternal for this carnal and short life. I will never turn from my heavenly husband to my earthly husband. From, from the fellowship of angels to mortal children. And if my husband and children be faithful, then am I theirs. But until then... God is my father. God is my mother. God is my sister, my brother, my kinsman. God is my friend most faithful. Oh, to God, we would have Bible-believing women who can be like this poor woman right here who would stand up for Jesus Christ.
do you, how many Bible believing women are there around the world? Uh, like one out of them, I don't know, 100,000 or something like that, right? How many Bible believing women now among Bible believers are this strong? Do we even have one in California? What about children, huh? Children. Didn't you know children during those days, they were 8 to 10 year olds and they were street preaching? They were street preaching 8 to 10 year old. I want to thank God that my family didn't think I was too young or, yeah. you know, that street preaching was not for me. Or They just took me out street preaching. Amen. And I street preached Amen. when I was seven and eight. Amen. And because of that, that's why I was, that strengthened me and that made me the person that I am today. And that's why your pastor's still here and he didn't leave this church and quit yet. You know why? Because I was strengthened with that kind of godly heritage. Yeah. Oh, to God, we would have children like that. Children. But they were eight to ten year olds who were burnt alive for street preaching. Burnt alive for street preaching. You can't even do street preaching. Come on. Yeah, come on. Let alone being burnt alive. There was a person named John Fetty, and he was tortured for many days. He had a son named William who wanted to visit his father in prison. And that little boy was only eight years old. When he went to visit his father in prison, the priest discovered, and he told that little boy, why thy father is a heretic the little eight-year-old he answered boldly my father is no heretic for you have balaam's mark wow. you talking about being bold for jesus huh wow. bold for jesus a little eight-year-old wow. stand up to big bullies yeah. that's right that priest got so much in a fit of rage that he whipped him mercilessly despite of how much that little boy cried out so much in pain that he fell into unconsciousness he was then dragged to the father and the father cried and hugged his boy only that his boy would be torn apart from his arms once more and they dragged that little boy to a separate cell the little boy eventually died from such heavy wounds your child is never too young to love Jesus Christ. Your child is Amen. never too young. You children, any of you children out there who can listen, are never too young to stand up for Jesus, Amen. to do soul winning, to do street preaching, to tell someone how to get saved, to read your Bible, to pray. That's right. No one is too young. No one is too young. How many children we got like that? Do you know how many children we got doing this? Do you know how many children we got going like this? Yeah. Like a television mindset that when you're preaching, they don't even understand yeah, what you're preaching. Right. They don't even understand what they're seeing. Yeah. We live in an extremely bad day and age that yeah. even, I know all of you parents can even agree with me on this. Because liberals are even frustrated that their children are getting such a robotic mindset, a television mindset. Yeah, come on. Even liberals. There were Berkeley people whining about that. Oh, what happened? What happened? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. You dropped this. That's, that's what happened. Right. Amen. That's good. You put this in their hands. That's what happened. Instead, you would tear this out of their hands and you would replace it with this. What about couples? How many couples do we have st standing strong for Jesus? There was a person named Timothy and he was commanded to show where he hid the scriptures by the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers wanted to find where the scriptures were were hidden so that they can burn the scriptures. But Timothy, he kept hiding them. And you know what he replied to the soldiers? Had I children, I would sooner deliver them up to be sacrificed than part with the word of God. Wow. The governor in a rage ordered for him to be tortured. And while the husband was being tortured, his wife named Mara gently I mean, she wasn't being mean. She wasn't pressuring him because she really loved her husband. So she was gently urging him to recant. I wouldn't blame the woman for doing that. But see this Laodicean mindset we're in? You know what the husband replied back to his wife? He did not say, oh, you got to understand. No, he rebuked her for not truly loving him. He said, you don't really love me after all. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, oh, well, husband, please understand that this is bad and this is hard. And, and then the husband, while he's being tortured, he said, no, you don't really love me after all. Because you know why? The couple's love would grow greater if their love for Jesus Christ is truly great. You understand? That's right. And you know what happened? You know what that woman did? That woman, she got, because she 
truly loved her husband and Jesus Christ, you know what she did? She said, I want to die with him. So the governor put the wife and the husband side by side crucified, and they both died for Jesus Christ. How many couples we got who can stand strong for Jesus Christ? I want to thank God for Jack Crayler and his wife, Sandy. And the wife wouldn't bail out and let the husband do the street preaching. She'd always stick by him, holding a sign, passing out tracts to a bunch of homosexual and liberals who are mad at her husband. How many Bible-believing couples do we have who can stand strong for Jesus Christ? We live in Laodicea, yeah. you got to understand. Amen. We live in Laodicea, you got to understand. I told you, too hot, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Too hot. You feel like burning, isn't it? You know why? It got so cold. That little bit of heat feels too hot for us. It's hard. We need this. We got... What about young adults? Young adults. Some of you are young adults worried about your future, what to do with your life. There's a guy named William Gardner. He was raised and educated under a merchant. So he had it all, his future all planned out. But you know, while becoming a successful businessman, he was instead grieved to see his own countrymen adhering to the Catholic mass. He realized that's just a cookie, man. That's, right. that's just a dumb little cookie. That's not Jesus Christ. You know what he did? He said, you know what? I don't care if I lose everything. I'm going to give up my job, my everything. So you know what? What he did, <laughs> I would not recommend you to do this. <laughs> he attended the mass where the king was going to be. And while the king and then the bishop and the cardinals were all raising up the way for it, this is the body of God. This is God. <laughs> William Gardner went up, grabbed that cookie out of the priest's hand, threw it on the ground and stomped it like this in front of everybody. Come on. You put that on the news, they'll say, oh, terrorist, 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 <laughs> hate group. Hey, yeah, yeah. Like, that's what, see, lay out to say. That's right. Lay out to say. They don't put on the news atheists who urinate on crosses and burn them up. That's good. Yeah, that's true. So the king tried to convince him that. You know, you were only influenced to do that, right? It was just youth and passion. You were just influenced. The king took pity on this boy because this boy had a promising future. Some of you young adults, young men and young women, too preoccupied by job and the future, that's enough to throw away your life in Jesus? Not this person. This person threw away his all. He said, no, I was not influenced to do it. My conscience told me to do it. I did it. So you know what? They burnt him. But you know what? They burnt him alive while he was in the pulleys as well. So while they pulled him up like this with the, with the weight on his feet, they burnt him alive at the same time. But you know what happened when, when they did that? One of the fires that burnt him swept over his body and burned down one of the king's Catholic ships. And then it burned down some of the Catholic ships to the ground Amen. with him. You know, that's uh, what happened to Christians today. What happened? What happened? Too hot, isn't it? Your ears are burning right now, isn't it? It's too hot, isn't it? Laodicea. Laodicea. You know what? This, this is, what, maybe this is 1500, uh, this is during the 1500s, you gotta understand. See? Too hot. Too hot. There was a guy named Sir Gasper Caplitz, and he was 80 years old. Some of you senior people feel like that you can bail out on Jesus, but this man, 80 years old, when he was about to die, you know what he did? He didn't complain. You know, he, he was excited. He was excited to die for Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what he complained about. What he complained about was that God didn't have him martyred soon enough until now. <laughs> That's what he said. Because he hated this wicked world. There was a concerned officer who begged him to ask pardon. Just ask pardon, just ask pardon so you don't have to die. But that old man excitedly replied, ask pardon, I will ask pardon of God, whom I have frequently offended, but not of the emperor. No, no, as I die innocent and with a clear conscience, he pointed to the martyrs, I would not be separated from this noble company of martyrs. And he died waiting eagerly for his head to be chopped off. Some of you old people, I understand, got health problems. You can't be active as much for Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. Old age and health problems 
doesn't get you out of the fight with us. You're still right. there. Right. If you're That's bedridden right. and you're yeah. stuck at home and you, yeah. you're just stuck in bed, you're still in the fight with us. You're not out. We got your prayers. We got your love. And you, we got your Bible reading. And we, can, and we can't minister to those nurses when you can. That's right. We can't give them the gospel when you can. And you see them every day and they have to hear the name of Jesus from your mouth when we can. See, no one's out of the fight. How many of you old people are standing up for Jesus Christ? Don't be out of the noble company of martyrs. Amen? Amen. Amen. Here's a minister, a ministry worker, a preacher. John Philpot, he was forced to sign a recantation. And guess what? He did sign the recantation. Fortunately, sometimes ministry work is too much, and then there are preachers who have second thoughts. But you know what he did? He asked for the paper again. You can imagine the Catholic inquisitors, they were so happy. Oh, he signed the paper. And then he said, uh, can I have that paper again? They gave him back the paper, and he tore it to pieces after that. He was like, no, I ain't, sign I ain't signing this. I'm not signing this. Enraged by this reaction, they imprisoned him and put him through 14 different trials. <laughs> because Philpot kept stumping the Catholic Church with his arguments, one got so mad that he just said, instead of the spirit of the gospel, which you boast to possess, I think it is the spirit of liquor, which your fellow martyrs have had, who were drunk before their death and went, I believe, drunken to it. Philpot retorted back, it appeareth by your communication that you are better acquainted with that spirit of liquor than the spirit of God. Wherefore I tell thee, thou painted wall and hypocrite, that God shall rain fire and brimstone upon such blasphemers as thou art. Too strong for you? Hot, right? Hot? Fire, fire, right? Fire. Laodicea, we got too cold, see? Too cold. This is the first time for cold people, see? And it will be hot. But if you're hot in Jesus Christ, this is just Amen. normal. Amen. Amen. This is just exciting. Yeah. This is just joy. This is like, why can't I have more of a passion for Jesus Christ? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's right. When he was approaching the stake to be burnt alive, <laughs> this is so funny, two soldiers, they offered him to carry him to the stake. And then Philpot, he replied back, would you make me a pope? I am content to finish my journey on foot. <laughs> Arriving at the stake, he said, shall I disdain to suffer at the stake when my redeemer did not refuse to suffer the most vile death upon the cross for me? He died quoting scripture. My third point is victory out of tribulation. Victory out of tribulation. There is such victory out of tribulation. We saw different kinds of people see martyred, dying for the name of Jesus. Children, old people, preachers, women, young adults, couples, etc. We've seen that. What kind of a layout to say we live in, you know? With young people, with couples, with old people, with pastors today, and then women. And children, what kind of a day and age we live in, Laodicea? Why can't it be like Philadelphia? <laughs> there is such victory, you understand. You got to realize this. When you pull through out of the tribulation, it is a life where you felt like you accomplished something. It is something that you feel proud about, that you can throw at the feet of Jesus. You feel like that you've grown up, you become more mature, that, and you're very grateful that you're no longer the immature you back then. And trust me, you're going to regret it when you mature more and more. And you look back at your That's immature right. self. That's, That's what's right. going to happen. Yeah, true. So trust me, you don't want to stay immature. If you stay immature like you are, when you look back, you're going, to be, you're going to be extremely embarrassed when God plays back your life and shows the immature side of you and all the embarrassing things that you did. <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about if you ever saw those video clips of the immature you back then? When you were 6, 13, 12, etc.? You would be so embarrassed, right, by some of the things that you said, the way that you acted, and etc. How much more at the judgment seat of Christ with every single thought, word, and action. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. But don't you want to look back at the judgment seat of Christ, how you were bold enough to pass someone a track? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's good. Where you are humble enough to cry for somebody when a person is going through hurt? Yeah, that's good. 
where some person did not, where the wicked world did not show grace to you, but you show grace to them instead? Wouldn't you feel proud about where you were proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ boldly out on the streets? Wouldn't you like to see that? Wouldn't you like to see the day where you are broken down, lost, you lost money, lost home, lost family? But see yourself praying and weeping to God and say, I believe in you, Lord. I trust in you, and I'm going to pull out. You know why some billionaires and millionaires would brag about their past, their past about, oh, I used to be a nobody, or I used to be a beggar. I did not graduate from this school and stuff like that. Because they like to show trials what they went through and how they had pulled wow. through and accomplished. That's true. What about you? Think about it. Look at this victory. Martyrs love to suffer for Jesus Christ so much that they once, uh, once they approach the stakes to be burnt, they hugged and kissed the stakes. Some, would, some of the martyrs would complain about wasting time to prolong their death. And they would say, come on, get it over with. Let, kill me, kill me. I want to die for Jesus. Some of the wives would see their husbands burnt alive that the, those wives would shout out, if he goes, so must die, so must die. Some martyrs would gather together to sing hymns and praise God in a circle right before the lions encircled them and tore them apart. Some of the martyrs would write letters to provoke fellow Christians to die for Jesus Christ. And when they write these letters, there's, got, there's one guy named Richard Roth who wrote, wrote the letter in his own blood as ink and used it like that. Some martyrs would rejoice in being crucified, being gushed with a crown of thorns, and a spear thrust through their sides because they, they felt like that, I just died like how my Savior died for me. <laughs> Some of the martyrs would die so happily that people were baffled. <laughs> and in fact, there were Catholic priests that could not explain it. So they had to explain why they were so happy when they died. They said, well, Satan took their souls before they actually died in the fire, making their senses a feeling past them. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Look at this. Victory after victory after victory. Look at this. Two citizens of Brescia, their names were Faustines and Jovita, suffered great torments for their faith. And then when they were being tormented for Jesus Christ, out of that bloodthirsty Roman Colosseum where Romans were shouting for their death and cheering for their death, a pagan, there was a pagan named Calocerius, who was struck so much with conviction. And this pagan, when he saw those two martyrs dying for Jesus, he just got up and he cried out, Great is the God of the Christians! And you know what? They killed him too after that. There was a proconsul who demanded Polycarp, Swear and I will release thee. Reproach Christ. But you know what Polycarp said? Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Amen. They burnt him alive at the stake. But you know, when they burnt him alive at the stake, they couldn't kill him. The fire couldn't kill him. So they were getting really annoyed. He was still alive. Out of anger, and that Polycarp, he was standing bold and strong for Jesus out of the fire. And they got so mad that one of them, out of anger, had to thrust a spear on him that his blood poured out and it doused the first fire. They had to light a second fire on top of that and that thing finally did the job and killed him. He died bold for Jesus Christ. He died standing. There was, a na there was another person named John Kutnar. When he came to the place of his execution, a Jesuit told him, embrace the Catholic faith, faith which alone can save and arm you against the terrors of death. Kutnar, he replied back, Your superstitious faith I abhor. It leads to perdition. And I wish for no other arms against the terrors of death than a good conscience. Then the Jesuit, he looked at the crowd and he sarcastically replied against Kutnar. He said to the public, These Protestants are impenetrable rocks. Kutnar, he replied back, you are mistaken. It is Christ that is the rock, Amen. and we are firmly Amen. fixed upon him. Amen. Right before he died, a person named Christopher Chober, he said this, I come in the name of God 
to die for his glory. I have fought the good fight and finished my course. So, and he turned to the executioner. He said to the executioner, executioner, he lifted out his neck, do your office. And he was beheaded. While approaching to the burning stake, Roland Taylor, he said this, thank be God, I am even at home. <laughs> right before he died, Reverend Saunders, he prayed flat face on the ground and he embraced the stake. And as he embraced the stake, he cried out, Welcome thou cross of Christ. <laughs> Welcome everlasting life. Right before he died, Lawrence, he cried out to his fellow martyrs as they were being surrounded by lions. And he shouted out so that all the Colosseum can hear about him and his fellow martyrs. These are the precious treasure of the church. These are the treasure indeed in whom the faith of Christ reigneth, in whom Jesus Christ hath his mansion place. What more precious jewels can Christ have than those in whom he hath promised to dwell? Right before he was burnt alive, Mr. Latimer, he told his fellow martyr, we shall this day by God's grace while they were being burnt alive at the stake, we shall this day by God's grace light up such a candle in England as I trust will never be put out. Amen. Right before he died, uh, right before she died, Joyce Luz, a lady, she said this, when I know that I shall behold the amiable countenance of Christ, my dear Savior, the ugly face of death, does not much trouble me. Right before he died, Simeon Sesaki was so impatient to die. Kill me, kill me, kill me, come on, won't you kill me? He cried out, every moment delays me from entering into the kingdom of Christ. Right. You talk about victory, you talk about triumph. Yeah. What kind of Christians do we have in this day and age who have such stories of victory? Why do we hear every Sunday? Why do we hear every day? Why do you tell you... Tell yourself every day a victory of defeat. Or why do you tell yourself, why do you tell yourself every day rather than victory, but just defeat? Why is it a story of defeat yeah, that on. I hear every yeah. Sunday? Why is it a story of defeat that you tell yourself every moment of your life? It's hard. I'm about to quit. Lord Jesus Christ, you're being unfair. Wow, if there were only more people in the church, why didn't anyone get saved? Why is it always defeat out of your mouth rather than victory in Jesus Christ? Amen. These people embrace the suffering. These people embrace the trial. Instead of throwing off your cross, why don't you cling on to it and embrace it this time right. and hold it high for Jesus Christ and say, I got victory in Jesus. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite illustrations, and I'm finally done, Ignatius, he was about to be torn apart by lions, and as he was thrown in the Colosseum, the lions surrounded him. But he said, and as he cried out, Ignatius just opened up his arms, embracing the lion. He wasn't going like this, you know, or closing his He went like this. He was like, basically, he was embracing them because he wanted them to bring it on. He was like, come here, right here. Your food's ready, right here. And the lion just kept walking closer, closer, licking his chops. And the lion wasn't fed for days and about to eat him up and tear him to pieces. And Ignatius, his heart kept beating, not out of fear, but out of excitement and joy as waiting for that teeth, those fangs, to enter inside his body. And he was like so impatient. He said, come on, come on, come on. And Ignatius, he cried out, now I begin to be a disciple. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ Jesus. The lions approached him and Ignatius egged them on. <laughs> he was egging them on this way, that basically I'm your food, eat me up. <laughs> he said this, <coughs> excuse me, he cried out, I am the wheat of Christ. I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts that I may be found pure bread. The lions entered and ate their bread. <coughs> the, 
No matter what persecution that all of hell can throw at you, see, you can win the victory in Jesus. Amen. Now look, stop whining. Yeah. Stop being, feeling sorry for yourself. Stop being weak. Huh? And start getting to business for God. Start reading your Bible daily. Start praying daily. Start coming to church. Start managing your schedule and make time to make your, make your house a Christian home, to make your life a proper Christian life, to make this church a proper Christian church. Make time to do that now. Amen. Sacrifice, sacrifice your needs, your desires, your money. Sacrifice your time to do something more for Jesus Christ. We live in Laodicea. This is America. We try to live like Laodicean Americans. That's our problem. You got to go back to Philadelphia and say, I can't be like these everyday people. It's time that I make time for Jesus Christ. Embrace the cross. Stop running from it now. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar calls open. Will you come forward and embrace your cross and follow him? Here's a time that we offer to you to spend some time praying to the Lord, get some things right with God. Today's sermon, I'm sure for some people, which is still growing. Some of you are still new. Some of you are still growing in Christianity. I'm sure this was probably a hot or perhaps even a hard sermon. But it's good that you heard something like this because you need to understand and know how lukewarm this world has gotten. How cold their relationship with Jesus Christ has gotten. We've gotten too preoccupied on me, <laughs> me and me. So whenever something bad happens in your life, you whine. Do you know why? You think about me. That's why. It's always me. Me, me, me. It's not, it's never about Jesus. Look at these martyrs. Went through 60 different tortures and 11 more? And you whine about one, two, or three that you're going through? We've gotten so cold. Why can't we, why can't San Jose Bible Baptist Church, why can't Bible believers in all around the world be strong for Jesus? I remember those days where I would have only one person in the church and I would be so preoccupied with work and school and man, I felt so miserable and my, I was sick. But you know what? I am very happy for those days as well because it, I pulled through and proved myself to God that God, at least I've touched a little bit of what the martyrs went through and I proved my worth to you. If everything was comfortable in church, if everything was comfortable in your life, you've got nothing to prove to Jesus Christ. You, didn't even, you did not even pour out or shed one drop of blood. So at least prove some worth, right? Huh? With your little bit of trial, with your discomfort, your suffering you're going through, can't, can't you be proud about that and embrace the cross rather than throwing it out? I never understood that for a long time, and then until I kept preaching a little more and lived through life a little more and looked back in my past a little more, I truly understood about those sufferings and I thank God for them because I proved that I've grown up. You gotta grow up now. You gotta stop whining about little, every little thing in life. You gotta grow up and say, Lord, I want to give my life and suffer for you. Now, don't worry, God's not gonna throw you on the rack, okay? He's not gonna let you burn at the stake. God, I'm, I'm afraid, preacher. You should not be afraid. God knows the limits, the limits of what you can handle. And he will not give you greater than you can bear. He knows the perfect amount of weight that you can handle. Now that you got it, some of you are going through that trial. And if you are going through that trial, you got to tell yourself this. This is something I can handle. You got to realize that. You're not some eight-year-old who's being whipped mercilessly by some priest and then dragged to a separate cell and who died for Jesus. God will give you step-by-step step what you can handle. And that way you can prove your worth to Jesus Christ that you've grown up. Not only that, it's even for lost people. Lost people are watching you. They're going to see a mature side of you. You know that? On how you handle problems, on how you handle life's issues, family problems, and financial problems. Even lost people will admire your maturity, your accountability, your responsibility, your independence, your independence on how you handle life. 
Heavenly Father, I pray today's preaching has brought conviction to our hearers. I, I'm always happy and I'm always proud to preach this sermon every once in a while. You'll never get old, Lord. Fox's Book of Martyrs. I intend to keep reviving it, Lord, so that people around the world and people in our church will not forget Amen. the testimonies of the people who shed their blood for Thee. May San Jose Bible Baptist Church make you proud, Lord. And may we put, be put in the record of a church who made thee proud yes. through trials and suffering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.